From the newsrooms of the Sydney Morning Herald and The Age, this is Please Explain. I'm Samantha Selinger-Morris. It's Wednesday, June 21st. It's been a monumental week in Parliament. Multiple allegations of sexual harassment have been made about a little-known Victorian senator, David Vann. David Vann strenuously denies all the allegations. But since they surfaced a week ago, discussion about who knew about the alleged offences and how they were managed has dominated political debate. It's taken us all back to the political earthquake that was set off in 2021 when former Liberal staffer Brittany Higgins alleged that a colleague had raped her in a parliamentary office. And it now begs us to ask one vital question. Just how unsafe is Parliament House for women? Today, National Affairs Editor James Masola and federal political reporter Lisa Vicentin on how politicians and journalists treat the rumours that they hear in the corridors of Parliament. So we've had a massive week in Parliament with allegations of sexual harassment against a little-known Liberal Senator, David Vann. So Lisa, I'd like to start with you. Can you tell us about the allegations that Independent Senator Lydia Thorpe brought against Senator David Vann and what's happened since Lydia Thorpe made her accusation? Right. Well, this sort of unfolded over two days in the Senate on Wednesday last week. Senator Van was on his feet. He was giving a speech where he was attacking Labor over their handling of the Brittany Higgins rape allegation. Those opposite continue to attack Senator Reynolds and throw mud across the chamber while claiming in... And uh, Senator Lydia Thorpe, she's an independent from Victoria, she was sitting in the chamber listening to this and it clearly hit a nerve with her and she interrupted his speech and started yelling perpetrator at him. I'm feeling really uncomfortable when a perpetrator is speaking Senator Thorpe, about Senator violence. Senator Thorpe, that's, inappro- that's inappropate and reflected pulling the member and I have to ask you to withdraw that. I can't. And then she was given the opportunity to speak and she accused him of sexually harassing her and I think she used the phrase sexually assaulting as well. This person... Senator Thorpe, I would just warn you at this point... Harassed me, point, sexually this, assaulted that, 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 me... Senator, Senator Thorpe... And the Prime Minister had to remove him from his office... Senator and Thorpe. to have him talking about this today is an absolute disgrace. She was later forced to withdraw those remarks, but she returned to the Senate the next day and gave a more fulsome statement about what she said was a a culture in Parliament House. The building was, I guess, structurally unsafe in her mind. I was afraid to walk out of the office door. I would open the door slightly and check the coast was clear before stepping out. It was to the degree that I had to be accompanied by someone whenever I walked inside this building. And though she didn't name him this time around, it was evidently clear that she was referring to him and she again sort of described an incident that she said in her mind constituted sexual assault. I experienced sexual comments and was inappropriately propositioned by powerful men. One man followed me and cornered me in a stairwell and most of this was witnessed by staff and fellow members of parliament. has to be said at this point, on both those occasions, on the Wednesday and then on the Thursday, Senator Van strenuously denied that anything had happened between him and Lydia Thorpe and, and strenuously denied all of her allegations. Yeah. And then following that, Sam, uh, the next day, there was sort of rumours rippling through the building about there being a former Liberal MP who had similar allegations. And again, to make the point, David Van has denied these allegations, but Amanda Stoker, so former Queensland Liberal National Party Senator, then came forward and said that in an event in Parliament House, Senator Van had squeezed her bottom twice inappropriately. And, and you know, she put that on the public record too. And I understand that opposition leader Peter Dutton has said he's become aware of another allegation against Senator David Van. Is that right? Yeah, that's correct. He said there's a third person that he's spoken to through a third party, to be precise, who also has allegations against Senator Van. What do we know about how the Liberal Party responded to these claims when they were first raised two years ago? I understand the Lydia Thorpe incident, the alleged incident, was raised two years ago. Because there's been some question in the media about why it took a crossbench senator, Lydia Thorpe, to make an allegation under parliamentary privilege for the Liberals to investigate one of their own when the allegations against Van were known by some within the party's rank. So I guess, James, I'll ask you first, what do you think of the way the Liberals handled these complaints and was it sufficient? What we know is this. Um, 
Lydia Thorpe went to the Greens, she was then a Green Party leadership. She and Larissa Waters went and spoke to Simon Birmingham, who was the leader of the Liberal Party in the Senate at the time. They had discussions. They went and spoke to Senator Scott Ryan, who was the Liberal Party president at the time. They had discussions. An agreement was made to move the offices, you know, to separate because Van and Thorpe literally had offices next to each other. All parties say that at the time there was satisfaction with how the matters were dealt with. With Amanda Stoker, she has said publicly that she addressed the matter herself, that she was happy with where it had gotten to, that it was resolved. In both cases, there wasn't a desire for this to come out publicly, for a formal complaint to be made at that point in time. Now, obviously, subsequently, public complaints have been made. So that's what we know. What's difficult about that is you think, well, why wasn't this addressed? I think it's a difficult one. Um, I I think the way it was handled at the time was appropriate because the women didn't want to advance the complaints any further. Which, which makes me wonder about something that National Senate leader Bridget McKenzie said on Insiders a few days ago, you know, speaking about the sort of rumours that you hear around Parliament. She said, I've been here for 14 years. I hear a lot of rumours. And if I acted on every single one of them, that would not result in the best outcome. So I'm just wondering, do you think that this David Van situation might prompt parliamentary staff to sort of rethink how they handle the rumours they hear? I think to some extent, yes, there is a sort of a greater understanding or an awareness of needing to call things out is maybe the best way to put it, that women don't have to tolerate or people don't have to tolerate behaviour that's not acceptable. However, I do have some concern that if you're uh, you're almost always a woman, so I'll say if you're a woman in this building and you've been harassed, you look at what's happened in the last week, you look at the weaponization of the leaking of Brittany Higgins' text messages, if you look at the fact that Amanda Stoker had to out herself essentially because people were becoming aware that it was her and she was getting a lot of questions, that might have a chilling effect on some women. They may not want their name out there. They might say, look, I've got you know a mortgage, a car loan, two kids and a husband to support or a wife to support. I need this job. I'm not going to come forward. So I think it's still a case-by-case situation. Yeah, it's that really difficult balance uh, to walk and for political leaders to strike as well, I think, in wanting to get on the public record that someone is behaving poorly, but at the same time trying to find a way to do that if the complainant doesn't want to be identified and doesn't want to come forward. How do you do that? It comes back to that that question of how do you act on rumours and speculation? You can't publicly accuse someone of something if there's sort of an unnamed complainant behind the scenes or or it becomes very difficult to do so and for that person to defend themselves as well against a complaint that's not sort of it's half in the public and half not. Right. And so I'd love to take a step back because James and Lisa, you've both been reporting on politics for years. Lisa, I know you've been covering federal politics for three years. James, you've been covering federal politics for 15 years. So does this go back, these sort of the smoke or rumours about women perhaps feeling unsafe or even harassed in Parliament? Is this something you've heard over the years? I think since the advent of this new parliament and, and really since the, the, the Brittany Higgins allegation, there has been a lot of effort to try and change the culture. And so I have only been here for three years. I've, I've personally never felt unsafe in the building, but my experience obviously is not universal. There are probably women, even since those changes have been made, who have had bad experiences, possibly terrible experiences, but we're at least seeing some steps to try and change the culture. Culture. I mean, there's a parliamentary workplace support service that exists now. You go into the women's bathroom, there's a hotline, there's sort of cards with a hotline that you can call that you can confidentially talk to someone about it. So there are reporting mechanisms that are slowly being set up to try and turn around this culture. I think the Higgins moment was, or the Higgins allegations rather, were a moment for the culture of this building. I think Rochelle Miller in that Four Corners report Again, she raised allegations against former MP Alan Tudge. He's denied them. Those two things taken together, and they happened about, those those reports came about four months apart. They really created a moment. They led to the Jenkins Review, as we all know. The Jenkins Review said that one in three parliamentary staffers, you know, those who'd been surveyed, had been sexually harassed at some point in time in this building. That's a shocking figure for a workplace that's supposed to set the standard for the nation, right? It it, it really is. So to Lisa's exact point, you know, although those allegations um, raised by Higgins and Miller have been denied, 
what they've made people do is stop and think in a way that we probably haven't done. What's different now is I think people are more aware of these things. There's a lower tolerance. Okay, one of the mechanisms that's been put in place following the former Sex Discrimination Commissioner Kate Jenkins report is a Parliamentary Workplace Support Service, or PWSS. That was established late last year. Is that working, or can alleged victims only achieve meaningful action by going public? PWSS is an interim measure. It's got some powers. It is able to offer counselling. It has some investigative functions as well if there's a serious complaint made. What the government, and it's taken a while, what will replace it or subsume it is a better word, is the Office of Parliamentary Staffing and Culture. That will have legislation underpinning it. That will have more or stronger other investigative powers um, and it will still offer offer that counselling service. Um, what it will also crucially do is give staffers some recourse. So having those structures in place, uh, I think we'd all hope, will, I guess, create a bit more of a security of tenure and hopefully improve the culture of, of the building too. I think it's an, an incredibly important reform. I mean, one of the problems that we've had in Parliament House is it's such a unique workplace where the MP is basically the HR manager of the office as well. So you need somewhere external to that, somewhere independent to that to take your complaint. And so this is the first real kind of body set up to specifically deal with those sorts of complaints in this building. And you have to remember this building is, has thousands of people that work in here on a sitting day. It sort of expands in size greatly, but even not on a sitting day, there's still thousands of people. So it has been quite absurd that there hasn't been that particular sort of office set up to, to, to handle such matters. So I think it really is a great reform. However, it's sort of a, a bit yet to be tested. It's still finding its feet. So it will really be a test to see how it goes. Right. And so James, I'll go to you now. What happens now? I, I understand David Van, who is now an independent, has plans to return to Parliament after a short break. He, of course, has resigned from the Liberal Party under great pressure from from Peter Dutton and the party. Yeah, that's correct. He's not in Parliament this week. There's a five-week break now, the winter break for the federal Parliament. My understanding from conversations with him is that he plans to return in August when Parliament sits. He's lost his positions on all parliamentary committees because they're sort of held and provided or parceled out, if you like, by the Liberal Party. He's lost a deputy chairmanship, about $25,000 a year in additional salary for losing that deputy chairmanship. He'll move to the crossbench and he'll be, I, I think, pretty lonely there, at least for a while. The question is, now that he's left the Liberal Party, now that he's been kicked out of the Liberal Party room, does he remain in Parliament? My understanding is that he intends to, but you know, as recently as this morning, the Prime Minister said it'd be good for him to leave. Peter Dutton and senior Liberals have made very clear they want him to leave. I don't think that pressure is going to ease off. The Liberal Party wants its Senate seat back. He was already facing pre-selection challenges. So I, I think watch this space, Sam. I might just ask you one final question, which is it's been 39 years since the Sex Discrimination Act was passed by federal parliament. It's been two years since the former Sex Discrimination Commissioner Kate Jenkins found that horrible stat that you'd, I believe, uh, previously spoken about, that four out of five people working in Commonwealth parliamentary offices had personally experienced sexual harassment. So how much hope do you have that things will change for women in parliament? I mean, I think we have to hope for change, don't we, Sam? I think as depressing as the last fortnight has been and almost unfathomable that we're here again and talking about this after the last two years, to the point earlier, you know, I think the structures are starting to be put in place. I think people are now more mindful, more aware. I think the guardrails are clearer. And with all of that taken together, I am hopeful but not certain that standards will improve in this building. I'm incredibly hopeful. I mean, in all of this discussion we've had today, we are talking about allegations that related to incidents that occurred two to three years ago. They're not things that have happened contemporaneously in the last couple of weeks, so they haven't happened post the Brittany Higgins allegations. Again, that's not to say that the culture in this building is perfect, but I'm incredibly hopeful that we have turned a corner and that uh, if there are you know, future things like this that, that emerge, 
there are the processes in place. There is the PWSS. I know just even being a, a woman in the press gallery, we've got a women's WhatsApp group with journalists all across the different media outlets and we text each other and we're texting each other through the week last week saying if anyone wants to go for a walk to clear their head, it's been a tough week. So that's something that's emerged out of this just from a personal perspective and I'm sure little things like that are happening all across the parliament as well. Lisa's just prompted me to think of something, what, listening to her then, Sam, that I've got to, I've got to add. There's two words we haven't used in this conversation today. Boys club. This place has been a boys club for more than 100 years. We're now at a point where the Labor Party in the parliament has 53% of its caucus being women. The Liberal Party, I wrote about this recently, is lagging badly behind on that figure, but they are trying to change. Having 53% women in the Labor caucus, having the Greens being roughly 50-50, having that huge crossbench now, uh, almost all of which is, you know, women, that has to change the culture of the place. That has to have an impact, you know. I, I just, I think that's a cause for optimism as well. Thank you so much, Lisa and James, for joining us. Thank you. Pleasure, Sam. Please Explain does not suggest that the allegations against Senator Van are true. Today's episode of Please Explain was produced by Julia Carcatzel with technical assistance from Debbie Harrington. Our executive producer is Ruby Schwartz. Please Explain is a production of The Age and the Sydney Morning Herald. If you enjoy the show and want more of our journalism, subscribe to our newspapers today. It's the best way to support what we do. Search The Age or smh.com.au forward slash subscribe. I'm Samantha Selinger-Morris. This is Please Explain. Thanks for listening.